because knowledge is the one thing that multiplies the more you give it away. You know, and, and you can't really hoard knowledge, and if you hoard knowledge, it deteriorates. But the more you keep investing in yourself and learning more and more and sharing it, um, it's the right thing to do for yourself, but also the right thing to do for the world. Hello everyone, thanks for watching Deep Neural Notebooks and listening to it. Um, this is the fourth episode of Deep Neural Notebooks. And so far the podcast has been about, uh, has been around conversations about deep learning, computer vision, chatbots, NLP, um, open source software, data science and things like that. But for the fourth episode, I wanted to switch gears a little bit. So this time I wanted to switch to the realms of education and knowledge. And my guest for this podcast is Mr. Mukul Pandya. Yes, I know it's funny how we both have the same name. Mr. Mukul is uh, the Editor-in-Chief and Executive Director of Knowledge at Wharton, which is a business analysis journal by the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. And uh, he is also a Senior Fellow of the Wharton School's uh, Department of Management. A winner of four awards for investigative journalism and an author of three books, Mr. Mukul has more than 30 years of experience as a biz- as an editor and a writer. So last month I was lucky enough to be able to attend a workshop at IIT Gandhinagar by Mr. Mukul Pandya called Lasting Leadership. So it was great uh, learning from Mukul sir about the key traits and characteristics that are important for leaders that make them stand out, that, that have made them so successful in the world. And uh, so it was through this workshop that I got to meet with sir and he was kind enough to do the podcast with me later on. In this episode, we talk about uh, Mukul sir's journey from being a young boy with dreams, wanting to go to Wharton and to not only just joining the college later, but also ideating and articulating one of the most influential and world's biggest knowledge sharing platforms that is Knowledge in Wharton. We talk about a lot of things in the episode. I asked him about his experience of interviewing uh, legends like Andy Grove the uh, founder of Intel, uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, and uh, and how, what he got to learn from those experiences. And uh, among, among other things, I asked him about the importance and drawbacks of technology in the conquest for knowledge, about figuring out the right balance and utilizing technology to exceed our abilities, about the core values that would be most important in the coming decades of unprecedented transformations due to AI and automation. And I also asked him about what he feels is the most important aspect of being a successful leader in the world. In the end, Mukul sir also shares some beautiful advice for uh, individuals who are seeking to learn and to share knowledge. Mukul sir is an absolute gentleman and he's one, probably one of the most humble and down-to-earth people I've ever met. Links to everything that we talk about will be in the description below. And I hope you like the conversation. And thank you for watching. So thank you Mukul sir for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you. And congratulations for uh, 20 years of knowledge at Wharton. How does it feel? I mean, 20, 21 years, I believe. Uh, 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 yes, 20 years. And thank you, Mukul. This is my first experience being interviewed by someone who has the same name as me. <laughs> so it's, it's thank you for this set, setting this record. Definitely. Sir, uh, I believe that uh, your born with Wharton, it started quite a long time back, even before uh, you started your M- master's in economics. So could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, so, uh, sure. So uh, basically the um, uh, the background to uh, uh, the involvement or the, the connection with Wharton goes back uh, long before uh, I even w- uh, went to the U.S. in 1989. Uh, and the, the story is when I was young, I was very confused about what to do in life and what to study. The one thing I knew is that as an undergraduate, I liked economics. And someone had told me that, um, you know, there are some places in the world that are really good to study economics. If you go to the UK, the London School of Economics is very good. And if you go to the US, there is a place called the Wharton School. Uh, So I mentioned this to my grandmother, who was an absolutely remarkable person and probably the uh, most important role model in my life. Uh, she brought me up, and uh, 
So I, she, I mentioned this to her and she took me to see a family friend uh, whom she had known for many years and he was a senior official at the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, and so she asked this person to give me some advice. Uh, and the advice that he gave me was that, um, you know, uh, places like Wharton uh, are for people who are very smart or very rich, uh, and that you should be more modest in your aspirations. Uh, and as you can imagine, I was quite crushed by this response. I didn't say anything. But, and my grandmother, who was with me, was also very surprised, but she didn't say anything either. But she saw the look on my face and realized I was, you know, kind of feeling very crushed. So as we were walking out of his house, <clears throat> she turned to me and she said, you know, the, uh, he doesn't know who, he doesn't know you, but I know you. And uh, if you decide to go to Wharton, I know that you will get there someday. Uh, and so I, so that was at the back of my mind. And I ended up doing my master's degree in economics from Bombay University. And I ended up going into journalism. At the, at the Times of India group. I right. worked for the Economic Times. Right. And after many twists and turns, I finally ended up at Wharton in February of 1998. Right. And at that time, you know, I remembered my grandmother's words. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, that that's how sort of the, the road to Wharton was kind of twisted and steep, but uh, I, I did ultimately end up there. And I've been there for about, almost 22 years now. It's quite a beautiful story. And uh, so let's talk about your uh, master's at Bombay University. So how was that experience? Were you always interested in economics? Uh, yes and no. So what I liked about economics was the social aspects of it. You know, because it, uh, uh, it was all about how societies become productive and how the fruits of that productivity are distributed. So I was interested in how production uh, and distribution of goods and services takes place and, and what this means for social welfare, especially of poor people. Uh, <clears throat> the part that I was not particularly good at was the mathematical part. Uh, so I, I, I always gravitated to the social science aspect of economics. And so I liked reading the, you know, the well-known economists, the classical economists like Adam Smith and Ricardo and Karl Marx and others. Uh, but the more econo econometric uh, models, uh, I always had a sort of tough time with those. And, and so it was sort of natural for me to, rather than going the quantitative route into, you know, uh, becoming an economist, to become a journalist uh, who was much more verbal rather than quantitative. Right. So then uh, after your master's, you worked for around 10 years in India as a business journalist. Correct. So how did that transition kind of happen from studying economics to sort of getting into the business journalism side. How was that transition? It was actually, you know, um, somewhat straightforward because at that time, uh, uh, back in 1978, 79, <clears throat> the Times of India group uh, or Bennett Colvin and company would conduct a national um, uh, recruitment exam uh, 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 for its training program. And getting into uh, the Times of India training program was almost as competitive as getting into IIT. <laughs> uh, because what would happen is uh, uh, about 2,000 people would apply uh, and they would submit essays on some current topic. And if you got through that, then about 200 or so people would be invited to write a written exam. And if you got through that, you went through a first round of interviews. If you got through the first round of interviews, you were called for a second written exam. If you got through that, you were called for the final interview, and then 20 people were selected out of initial 2,000. So I was very lucky that, uh, you know, I, I, I was part of the group that joined the training program in uh, uh, April of 1979, so almost a little more than 40 years ago. And, and it was a, a wonderful place to learn you know, the basics of journalism. I knew very little about it, but it was a, I had wonderful mentors and I, I was able to learn a lot there. Right. So you worked at the Economic Times for some yes. time and then for the Business World magazine? Yes. Right. That's so correct. was Wharton still at the back of your mind? Uh, during that time? <laughs> it's a good question. It it was decided definitely at way back because, you know, at that time, you know, I really didn't know uh, you know, 
uh, what what would what would happen. So I was very much focused on my journalism at the time. In fact, uh, I can tell you a short story. <clears throat> at the Economic Times, I uh, when I started on the editorial desk as a sub editor, and I had a very little idea of what editing actually means. So when the reporters would write their stories and submit it to me for editing, I would try to add a whole lot of complicated words, uh, trying to make them sound very, you know, jargony and economic sounding uh, text. And I would turn it into my, you know, chief sub editors as they were called and they would say, what are you doing? I mean, why are you doing all this? And so I said, well, I'm trying to make it sound like an economist. And they would say, you know, Go to the library, they said, and, and get a book. Uh, there, is, there was a book called <coughs> Newsman's English uh, and, and, and uh, uh, written by Harold Evans, who was the editor of the Sunday Times newspaper. Uh, and and uh, the, my colleague at the Economic Times desk said, get that book and memorize it. So I realized that Editing, what actually editing means, is the opposite of what I was doing. It is taking complex and difficult words and putting it into simple language that anyone can understand. And so what I had been doing is the opposite of it. So I sort of relearned uh, what editing meant. Many years later, uh, after coming to Wharton and starting Knowledge at Wharton, I had the opportunity to interview Harold Evans, who, who, who had just written his autobiography. And when I went to New York to interview him, I told him this story. Uh, and, and, and when he realized that I had read his book, he quickly asked me, he said, OK, tell me what's the most important thing you learned from my book. And I thought for a minute and I told him, the most important thing I learned from the book is if you have to read a sentence two times, it's not a good sentence. And he said, that's it. You've got the message. <laughs> You've got the main message of my book. Mm -hmm. So it was a you know wonderful learning experience, and I feel very fortunate to have had wonderful teachers and mentors. Right. So uh, after completing sort of ten years in India, you moved to the U.S. Yeah. You worked for uh, <coughs> Business News, New Jersey. Yeah. Um, and um, you also got to attend a business seminar at Wharton. Right. So how was that experience? Could you talk about how the seminar was? Sure. So uh, just to back up a little bit. Uh, Business News New Jersey was a very tiny newspaper when I joined it in January of 1990. Uh, it had only seven employees, and uh, I was the first full-time staff writer. The founder and editor was an absolutely brilliant journalist by the name of George Tabor. Uh, and though this Business News near New Jersey, which was near, published near Princeton, which is where George lived, uh, it was a very tiny paper, but George's professional background is he had been the business editor and the world editor of Time magazine. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so he was running this small newspaper with, but with professional standards uh, equivalent to Time magazine standards. And again, he became my mentor and I learned so much from him. Uh, he sent me to Wharton in 1991 because uh, he, he's, he, when he was um, editing the business section of Time, he would often send... Uh, reporters and editors from Time magazine to attend this program at Wharton. It's called Seminars for Business Journalists, and it has been going on for more than 50 years at Wharton. Uh, and it's like a, a week-long program where journalists from, business journalists from different publications uh, gather for a week, and they take classes with the Wharton faculty. And they step away from their day-to-day -day journalism to take a big look at what's happening in the world of business, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the world economy. Uh, they'll you know, take courses on accounting and things like that. Uh, and it was just <clears throat> probably one of the most stimulating educational experiences of my life. Because in India, I was very used to the lecture form of education. You know, I mean, I had done my master's in economics. But all our classes uh, at the Kalina campus in Bombay were more or less lecture-based. Whereas uh, uh, at Wharton, I found that the whole approach to education was very different, where we learned as much from one another, uh, and, and the professors were not trying to lecture to us. They were trying to engage everyone in conversations and try to draw out knowledge from everyone. So it, they didn't treat the students as though the students were dumb and they were smart. 
they, they treated their students with respect and, and, and they, that led to a very stimulating educational environment and I just fell in love with Wharton uh, uh, with that. Uh, at that time I was also um, doing a lot of freelance writing for different publications with George's uh, uh, support and encouragement. So I, was, I, I wrote for the New York Times, I wrote for The Economist, uh, I wrote a little bit for Time Magazine, <clears throat> again thanks to George. Uh, and whenever I did these stories, I would reach out to the professors at Wharton because, as as experts for for their comments, and this went on for about seven years. Uh, and then in '98, I was approached by the school to say that they wanted to start a new publication, uh, and they asked if I would go there and uh, and, and and start it. Uh, and that's how I ended up at Wharton. Right. So you joined Wharton in 1998. Yes. To set up a business magazine. Yes. For the school. Yes. So what was the inspiration behind the whole idea? Yeah. So that, that's that's a great question. The uh, the, the school's point of view was that <clears throat> uh, uh, in in uh, so in 1997 98 uh, Wharton was doing very well in the business school rankings. Uh, uh, at the same time, Wharton has ha- had and has uh, a very large faculty base. So there are, you know, more, somewhere between two hundred and fifty and three hundred faculty members, uh, and the re- and, and you know many many academic departments and research centers. And the reason for this large faculty size is that there is a not just a, an MBA program, but also an undergraduate business program at Wharton. And to support this large student body, you need more faculty. Uh, So uh, I think the school's objective was to see if they could take some of this research and disseminate it just as, you know, publications like the Harvard Business Review at Harvard or the Sloan Management Review uh, at MIT had been doing for many many decades. Uh, And Wharton didn't have a publication of that type, and I think that was part of the school's motivation for wanting to do this. Right. So initially it was going to be a print magazine? Yes. But in 1998, May, I believe, it turned out to be an online portal for sort of spreading education from from the hallways of Wharton and other sources to all around the world. So it must have been, since you also came from a print, print journalism background, how was how was the experience of sort of exploring the web to sort of do the same? Role? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> that's a, again a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, the the background to how it ended up as a print publication is that uh, I, I, I <clears throat> the first couple of months that I was at Wharton, I went around speaking to a lot of faculty uh, and asking them what kind of publication the school needed. And one of them, uh, a management professor by the name of Jitendra Singh, he asked actually a very good question. He said, if you launch another print magazine, how are you going to position it against HBR or Sloan Management Review? And I realized then that these publications had been around for decades and they were very successful in their own way. You know, And so for Wharton to come along 80 years later and say, here is the Wharton Business Review or the you know, Wharton Management Review, uh, was not a very original idea. So I was trying to figure out how, if we wanted to do something that we can describe in a couple of sentences as being unique, how would, what would we do? How would, how can we do something different? And luckily in 1998, it was sort of the dot-com bubble was, you know, a lot, lot of hot air was being blown into the dot-com bubble. Uh, and, and I thought maybe one way to do something different would be to forget about print and just leapfrog over print and do an online only journal uh, that was not so much an online publication but almost like a knowledge capturing and distribution system that used the web as its primary publishing medium. Uh, and then I got very excited about the idea. I had, I had never done an online publication before, but that was both exciting and scary. Uh, and it was a way of sort of getting out of the comfort zone. Uh, and I thought, you know, that, that, that that's that that's the way to go. Uh, it was uh, not that easy to convince people around the school. <laughs> that was going to be my next question. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, you know the job that they have hired me for is actually not the right job. <laughs> uh, uh, but that that's a different story. Right. 
So, um, I'd like to come back to the role of internet and web technologies yeah. in education later. But now, uh, <coughs> talking about knowledge at Wharton, I believe not only was the idea good, but even the execution was bang on. So, you were able to get 33,000 subscribers in the first year, yeah. 66,000 in the next year. Yeah. So, uh, what advantages do you think the web, I mean, had in sort of this boom yeah. in, in, in the number of people you reached? Yeah, so that, there are there are three three aspects to it. Uh, I think the first aspect is that there is so much content being published on the web, or that was being published on the web. Uh, the threshold to entry or the barriers to entry were extremely low. Anybody who could set up a web page mm. could actually set up a website, right? Uh, so so uh, and that's even before the days of social media, where you know putting things out there in the public domain uh, uh, has become even easier now than it was back then. But even then, you know, uh, put publishing content on the web was quite easy. Because of that, there was a tremendous premium for brands that people could trust. You know, so if anyone, for, so in, when it comes to business knowledge, if anyone can publish anything about business, then how how do readers know whom to trust and that's where the brand comes in you know so if if since wharton had been you know a reputed business school for you know more than a century uh, there was a tremendous amount of trust in the wharton brand and yes. i think that was the first factor that contributed to knowledge at wharton uh, you know uh, benefiting from the benefiting from the growth that was number one the second factor was that if you look at the web as a publishing medium, uh, it is relatively easy to find information on the web if you because of search engines like Google, etc. So if you're looking for you know something on you know banking or finance, uh, you you can just search for it, and then if there are there's a publication like Knowledge at Wharton that has articles about banking and finance, uh, finding it is relatively efficient. So the so the web is an efficient medium for finding information, and that was sort of the second factor that contributed to knowledge at Wharton success more so than if we just had a print magazine sitting in some stall somewhere. Mm. So that's number two. Uh, also remember that it becomes like a global distribution. I mean, the one big yeah. advantage of the web publication is that there are no printing costs, there are no mailing costs. You know, as soon as you launch, you have global distribution from day one. Uh, the third factor that benefited us was that we offered knowledge at Wharton at an unbeatable price. Uh, it was, it was, and is, and has been completely free, and and that was the part of knowledge at Wharton that I was most passionate about, keeping knowledge free for anyone who wants to learn, and the reason for that actually ties back to what I said earlier about my grandmother and 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 the first experience that I narrated. When my grandmother's words came true, and I did end up at Wharton, I never forgot what it feels like to be told that in this world there are these amazing places of learning like Wharton, but they are not for you. And I decided once I got there that no child should ever have to hear those kinds of words. So if I can take knowledge from Wharton and use the web to deliver knowledge from Wharton for free to any kid in the world who wants to learn, that's a good way to spend your life. And so that's what I've been trying to do. Definitely. Sir, so what were some of the challenges that you faced along the way? I'm sure it, it was, I mean, the success is quite <coughs> fast, but I'm sure in the, in how many, 20 years? Ah, yeah, yeah, 20 years. So how, how, I mean, how, what sort of challenges did you face along the way? Uh, I mean, the first challenge, of course, was, as I said, <clears throat> this was not an idea that uh, I had been hired to implement. Uh, so I was hired to start a print publication. So basically convincing my boss that uh, what you have hired me for, the job description that you have uh, written up for me should basically be torn up. Yes. And, and uh, if you want to get to the objective of taking research from Wharton and sharing it globally, we need a very different channel than a print newsletter or a print magazine. Uh, 
and, and, and so initially there was a certain amount of resistance and skepticism, which is understandable because at that time, no other <clears throat> business school was using the web quite in this way. I mean, there, there, uh, there, it's not that there was no, no web publishing going on at other business schools. There was. Uh, and I spent my first couple of months looking at the websites of about 50 different business schools to see what kind of web publishing was going on. And what I found was that they all had online publications that were, that were digital copies of print publications. You know, so if they had a quarterly magazine, when they sent it to the printer, they would also send it to the webmaster and say, you know, turn this into a PDF and put it up on the web. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so the thinking was all print-based. Mm -hmm. And at the final stage of printing, they would also put it up online. So, so what I was proposing was the opposite of that, which is think of the web first. Mm -hmm. and, and if you imagine a publication that is designed only to be published for the web, how would you do that? So, and that was not being done by other business schools. So, con trying to convince everyone that this is uh, the way to go was probably the first and biggest challenge. Uh, luckily for me, uh, I had you know good mentors even at Wharton, and one of them gave me some excellent advice. Uh, he basically said, "Things happen at Wharton when enough, enough faculty members went, want them to happen." Mm. So as I went around the school meeting with different faculty members, I would uh, ask them what kind of publication we should have. And uh, when they gave me their ideas, I would ask, okay, so how about an online-only publication? And then they would be very intrigued because the dot-com bubble was, mm -hmm. as I said, you know, going strong and everybody was very hyped up about the internet. And they would say, well, that sounds interesting. And by then I had written you know, a 14-page proposal about why Wharton needs an online journal. And I would send it to these professors. And, and like good professors, they would treat it like, almost like a student essay and they would critique it and mark their comments <laughs> and then they'll send it back to me. And without exception, I accepted all their comments and incorporated it into the proposal. So pretty soon what happened was what started out as one person's you know, crazy sort of inspiration became uh, a consensus-based document with input from about 30 or 40 faculty. Mm -hmm. And that's how, it can, and, and in a university, decision-making is not top-down, it's usually very consensus-based. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was very lucky, I sort of stumbled into some of these things. And, and that's how uh, you know, the idea of knowledge at Wharton was approved. Uh, so I think that was one of the biggest challenges. Uh, another challenge I would say is that uh, uh, when we initially launched Knowledge at Wharton, we got, uh, if we wanted to keep it free, we would have to find some corporate sponsors. And we got three sponsors, McKinsey, Merrill Lynch, and Ford, who supported us in the very first year. Uh, but this was in 1998-99. By 2001, the dot-com bubble had burst. And the pendulum swung to the other extreme. And then finding sponsors after that was very difficult. So we had to pivot. We had to be fast learners. Uh, we had to figure out a way to adapt to this situation. Uh, and we, we came up with a different model of sponsorship where we would work with our sponsors to produce some content that would be of interest to their customers. And companies like GE Capital, Intel, Microsoft, these companies all sort of uh, came on board as sponsors. Uh, uh, in, the, in India, there were companies like Wipro, uh, uh, Infosys, uh, TCS, uh, you know, m many of whom had their clients overseas. Mm. Uh, they, they, they also supported us. And thanks to a large number of, uh, you know, partners like that, we were able to keep knowledge at Wharton going. Those are some of the challenges. Right. So, so how has it evolved over the years? How has knowledge at Wharton evolved? I mean, since the mediums have changed, channels, there are podcasts that are being right. getting popular day by day. So what sort of strategies did you, did knowledge at Wharton use to sort of, you know, increase the audience? So there were basically three different things that happened. Uh, the first was that... Um, at least in the initial years, we adopted a strategy of um, uh, customizing knowledge at Wharton for different parts of the world. Uh, the first of those was probably in, 
in Spain and Latin America, where in 2003, uh, with help from uh, Banco Santander uh, and their non-profit arm called Universia, we launched a Spanish and Portuguese version of Knowledge at Wharton in Madrid uh, in 2003. Uh, and then Pat Harker, who was the dean at the time, got very excited about doing Knowledge at Wharton editions internationally. Uh, and he uh, encouraged us to launch a Chinese version of Knowledge at Wharton. So that happened in Shanghai in 2005. Uh, then I got very excited about doing an Indian version. So we launched an India Knowledge at Wharton website uh, in 2006, November. And then an Arabic version was launched in 2010 and an Israeli version was launched in 2012. So, so when you say you uh, an Indian version, so was the language Hindi or was the content for... Uh, no, no the, the, the language was English, but the content was customized for India. Okay. And then we realized over the years, I mean, uh, again, talking about challenges, one of the challenges was uh, trying to support all these international editions with a very small team in Philadelphia hmm. uh, uh, proved to be much more challenging than I had expected, especially since uh, universities are not multinationals. You know, uh, multinational organizations have an infrastructure and systems and processes hmm. uh, that allow them to do businesses, hmm. business internationally. Here we were a tiny department in a very old and prestigious university, but it was still primarily, you know, U.S. based. They had some international uh, outposts, but it was by no means a global organization with global systems. Uh, and that became clear to me over the years. And then the costs, uh, you know, became hard to support. So we, uh, in 2013, 2014, we ended up co consolidating all our international editions into a global edition. Mm. Uh, so that was one dimension of our growth. The second dimension was, as you correctly said, I mean, when we started, we were just doing print or text-based uh, content. But by 2006, uh, you know, podcasts had become, uh, you know, quite popular. And, and we started doing podcasts uh, in 2006. Uh, we also briefly, uh, in India, had a mobile version of Knowledge at Wharton when we launched it in 2006 because... We realized that in India, a lot of people are accessing content on mobile phones. Mm. So instead of sending email newsletters, as we were doing with our other religions in India, we had email distribution, but also SMS-based distribution. Mm. Uh, and this is back in 2006. So this is a link to the article or the, art yeah. the whole article? No, the link to the article would be sent as a text message. Uh, and this was in company with a partnership with a wonderful company in Mumbai called Nitcore. Uh, they helped us, uh, you know, Rajesh Jain, the CEO, he really helped us think through all these things uh, way back when. Uh, so this was a, you know, part, uh, when we launched, uh, we had developed our own uh, in-house studio doing video content. Uh, so so uh, we were a basically able to give people options of either reading Knowledge at Wharton or listening to Knowledge at Wharton or watching Knowledge at Wharton, depending on how they felt most comfortable learning. So this was the second sort of dimension. Uh, the third and the most exciting dimension was, uh, as we while we were doing all these international editions, uh, I still remember it was in our in two thousand four on our fifth anniversary. We had just launched Knowledge at Wharton in Spanish and Portuguese. We were going full steam ahead, launching to launch it in Chinese, and we had one of our annual advisory board meetings. So every year we would have a group of advisors who would get together. And we would tell them what we are doing and we would, for half the day, and the other half of the day we would tell them, this is what we want to do in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, they would give us advice. So, of course, I was very gung-ho about, yes, we've done it in Spanish, now we're doing it in Chinese. And which new countries and which new languages should we conquer next? Because I was on this uh, <laughs> global do domination bandwagon. <laughs> And, and there's a wonderful man by the name of Terry Suppers, who's a very senior marketing manager at G Capital. He very quietly said, um, why are you thinking of growth only in terms of new languages and new countries? Have you ever thought of doing anything for high school students? And as soon as I heard those words, it sort of touched my heart. And I said, yes, this is what we need to do. So we started working on laying the foundations of a knowledge at Wharton version for high school kids focusing on financial literacy, leadership, entrepreneurship, things like that. 
and we almost launched it in 2009, but we had a setback because of the financial crisis. But we did not give up on the idea and finally launched it in 2011. And that has grown, you know, alongside Knowledge at Wharton, Knowledge at Wharton High School has grown and has about a quarter million users. Knowledge at Wharton has about three million and Knowledge at Wharton High School uh, has about quarter million. And they are now part of a new, it has grown so big that, you know, it's not possible for me to manage both. So it has recently moved into a new department called, uh, about six months ago, called Wharton Global Initiatives. Uh, and it uh, continues to do very, very well. Uh, and the last element I would mention is that for five years, we also had a daily radio show on Sirius XM radio, which is a satellite radio uh, called Knowledge at Wharton Radio. And that was a daily two-hour program. Uh, <clears throat> and, and we did some wonderful programming there. We did more than a thousand shows. Now, recently, the school has gone in a different direction, launching a different version of that show called the Wharton Business Daily. But for five years, Knowledge at Wharton Radio, you know, uh, created a lot of audio content. We would interview 30 to 40 business experts every week. And a lot of these became podcasts that we would distribute globally. So uh, it, it's been really exciting exploring all these different dimensions of knowledge at Wharton. And uh, uh, it's, been a, it's been a great ride. Not only did you uh, conceptualize and ideate knowledge at Wharton, but you've in a way also been at the forefront of it, interviewing people from multiple disciplines, uh, interviewing legends like Andy Grove and EPJ Abdul Kalam. So how is this? How is that experience of meeting such legends, learning from their stories about their experiences, the work they do? How could you talk about that? Oh, absolutely. So it's, <clears throat> it feels like the best job in the world. I mean, uh, if any, if you like to learn, the opportunity to uh, sit in front of some of the, as you said, some of the uh, you know most insightful thinkers and leaders in the world. And just be curious and ask them all kinds of questions uh, and learn from them is is just like being a kid in a candy shop. <laughs> so it, it's been an amazing experience. And uh, uh, especially the fact that we had all these international dam, uh, editions of Knowledge at Wharton meant that, uh, you know, that from time to time I had opportunities to talk to the people, uh, different leaders in different parts of the world. Uh, about uh, how they thought about things and uh, what kind of uh, you know successes they had had, what kind of failures they had had, uh, and and uh, the two names you mentioned, uh, Andy Grove and APJ Abdul Kalam, were probably two of the most memorable uh, interviews that uh, I was fortunate to be able to do, uh, and uh, the fact that they were willing to share their knowledge. Uh, not just with me, but for, uh, everyone who was reading knowledge at Wharton and, and who could learn from them, uh, uh, that that was even more satisfying and more gratifying. That's the whole reason I'm here, doing these <laughs> podcasts and talking to people. Sir, yeah. So um, since you interview people from a lot of different fields, how do you prepare for an interview? What sort of research goes in before you sort of get to talk to someone? I think that's an excellent question. And... Uh, you have to do a lot of homework uh, in order to do a good interview. Uh, in fact, let me tell you a story. When I went to interview Andy Grove, uh, it was part of a book that we had written called Lasting Leadership. Yeah, you can show um, You know, uh, this was yeah. published in 2014. And Andy Grove was chosen as the top leader of the previous 25 years uh, by... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Nightly Business Report, which is a f famous business television show, and Knowledge at Wharton. Uh, and I went to interview him in his office of his nonprofit in, uh, in, in California, uh, just near San Jose. And when I went for the interview, I had done a lot of homework and I had come up with a whole set of questions. Uh, and the very first question that I asked him, he just looked at me and he <laughs> said, this is such a lame question. And Shattering. Yeah, it was, uh, oh God, what do I do now? You know, so <laughs> I, I apologized to him and I said, okay, I'm going to start again. And the second question I asked him was all about his childhood and his role models in childhood. 
and then he started warming up and he said he started talking about his life and how his he was from a jewish family and his father ran a dairy farm and his da- father left during the second world war and was not seen again so he really grew up without a father figure in his childhood and then when he got to new york he had this really tough professor called professor schmidt uh, who had this habit of you know asking very tough questions to every student and if the students could answer those questions then he would admit them into his class so as soon as he told him me this story i i said to him oh, i can see why this professor had such a profound impact on your life because the way he interrogated you then is the way you interrogated me now mm-hmm. and and he just burst out laughing uh and that broke the ice and mm-hmm. and uh after that i was supposed to have only 45 minutes with him but he spent more than two and a half hours with me uh and 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 so uh, it's probably one of the most memorable interviews of my career uh professor apj abdul kalam was also a very uh, inspirational interview and uh what was really remarkable about him is he had come to uh philadelphia for the wharton india economic forum as a speaker this is after he had already stepped down as the president and what was just so remarkable about him was his ability to instantly connect with people no matter what level they were so you know talking with the senior deans and the faculty uh he was completely at ease but he was also equally at ease talking to the guards and the security people and very friendly and open and uh caring towards them and and just to watch him be like that without any airs and without any you know sense of self importance or ego but just being there as a human being relating to other human beings that was uh, probably the most important lesson i learned from him so if you um, as you go about doing your podcasts if you treat every conversation as an opportunity to learn uh, you know then then you it, it will keep enriching your life and then you can share those riches with everyone who listens to you So it's a, it's a good way to be <laughs> right 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 as so, a talking about role models could you share some of your role models uh your grandmother was one definitely my grandmother uh, my grandfather was also an, an amazing role model one of the kindest and gentlest people uh <clears throat> whom i have ever known so my grandparents brought me up my parents were very remarkable people they were both college professors uh i had teachers and role models everywhere you know in in school i was lucky to have wonderful teachers in college i had great professors uh after coming going to the us i had uh, a wonderful mentor george tabor at wharton I, i can't even count the number of amazing you know people and mentors and teachers from whom i have learned uh in a way the world today is a we are living in the golden age of learning uh because there is so much knowledge being shared you know if you just go looking for it uh that that for anyone who wants to learn this is really the age of the autodidact you know you can you can create your own learning path and be, become a lifelong learner uh i i th- there are very few periods in history uh when this has been possible but i think today is a time for that uh so uh, you you can find your own you know teachers wherever you go mm. it's uh, so let's talk about education a little bit in front okay. of your research interest so like you said we can all agree that this is the golden age of learning and uh, platforms like knowledge at wharton coursera youtube mm. uh, mit open coursera they all provide access to free knowledge from the top professionals and the top universities to people who cannot be there mm. um so i'm sure we can agree on all the positives that technology brings but now i want to talk about the caveat sort of mm. uh, of sort of technologies in the field of education and so the internet is all overwhelmingly huge mm. and uh, not only is the most informative thing one click away but so is a distracting youtube video and things mm-hmm. like that so uh do you think with sort of uh, <coughs> attention spans of humans getting shortened day by day mm-hmm. do you think the benefits of 
technology for education can they outweigh the sort of shortcomings the drawbacks that's a, that's a wonderful question and and i think that the answer is a qualified yes in my view uh and the reason why i say that is that um for those who want to learn the opportunities do exist you know you i mean as you said you can take a course on coursera you can take a course on edx uh, you know or uh, and and you can learn whatever you want to learn if somebody wants to learn how to cook they can go to a youtube video and cook recipes that they've never thought uh, and there are members of my family who do that <laughs> so uh, so so all that is very very true uh, but the other the flip side is also equally true that there is a tremendous possibility of uh, the technology becoming a means of distraction uh, and and it creates a sort of as you said a short term attention span and i think what needs to be done is uh, the use of technology needs to go hand in hand with a very thoughtful approach towards how to still your own mind and and how to create a sense of spaciousness and balance in your life so that you don't get overwhelmed by all the you know information that keeps flooding towards you actually the, if i can tell you uh, a, a, a short story the one my uh, george tabor one of my 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 mentor and one of my mentors in journalism uh, once told me that if you want to be a good journalist don't focus on the waves focus on the tides and i took that to heart and what i understood him to mean is that at a superficial level there are a lot of waves that that can be distracting but if you don't get allow yourself to get distracted by the superficial aspects of things and you go deep uh that's when you tap into the tides and the deeper currents and that has to be a conscious effort on your part if you don't want to get swept away by this fire hose of information that will keep blowing towards you you know so as we go and and there are a number of you know people who have been writing about these things uh, uh uh who have been sounding the alarm about using technology in a thoughtful way so that we don't become slaves to the technology but that we use technology as a tool uh to accomplish uh something that is very human and and we don't we don't we don't lose uh our humanity by that so i i that, that's at least what i think so so any practical advice that you can give to students probably who are just starting out and trying to figure out the internet trying to f- figure out the right balance between um using the internet for your uh, for improving your knowledge increasing your knowledge and also probably using offline methods like books and things like that to so how can people figure out the right balance in your yeah i mean again that's a great question and i wish there were an easy answer to that <clears throat> i don't think the answer is very easy uh, uh i think like a- anything else in life uh some of this balance comes through maturity you know so when 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 you are young it's very easy to get you know caught up by the latest greatest thing uh you know and 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 to be swept away by the currents and and when that happens i think the important thing is to realize is that uh, this has happened to young generations over many many years uh this is not something that technology or the internet has created new mm. you know uh as you become older and more mature and and you learn to dis- differentiate between what truly matters and what is superficial uh that this gets this gets sorted out and then you focus on using technology to do what you want to do rather than being swayed by it uh so i don't know if there is any shortcut to this uh i think that uh again as i said recognizing that Uh, online is not the only way to learn and to especially in the field of education to take a more blended and more holistic approach towards uh, you know reading books or listening to lectures or just taking time to digest and think 
mm-hmm. and to create a sense of silence and to create a sense of uh, uh, spaciousness in your life. Uh, and using that to go hand in hand with sort of the constant, uh, you know, so surfing the tides rather than being swept away by the waves. Uh, that that that's that's that that's what I would suggest. Right, sir. So, so that brings me to my next question: um, automation and algorithms, data science, and AI things like that are um, transforming the world. Yeah. They are, so we do not have an <coughs> idea of what the job market what will look like. In a decade, or in two decades, in two thousand thirty, two thousand forty. So, what things do you believe would be perennially important mm-hmm. as we go through, and what things should we teach to students who are just starting out, to the to students in grades one to ten? What things to sort of inculcate? What behaviors to inculcate? What qualities to work on? And since we since we don't know uh, what the job market will look like, so what things can they work on? Uh, so I would say that's again, again a wonderful question. So thank you for asking. Uh, I, I I would say a couple of things. Uh, I know very little about AI and machine le- learning and natural language processing and all the different aspects of AI that are coming up. In fact, <clears throat> you being at IIT probably know a lot more than I do about these things. Uh, but it's clear that these you know these technologies are growing very fast and that they will have a profound impact on the way work is done in the future. And at least the signs that seem to be appearing right now is that the kind of work um, that was uh, that was eliminated by automation in the past was you know, largely you know, blue-collar work. But as these new changes mm-hmm. take root, uh, some white-collar work also may be automated. Um, and, and so a common example that is used is, you know, do you need doctors anymore if, you know, the uh, AI programs can, you know, look at x-rays and come up with diagnoses, uh, can diagnose illness much faster than even a hu- human doctor can. And and I think that there are, you know, a lot of people who are concerned about these kinds of issues. Uh, to my mind, um, automation and AI... Uh, will basically be tools. I mean, the best way to deal with it is to think of them as tools uh, so that you can get a clearer picture, maybe a faster picture uh, into the human condition. But it does not substitute for the human element. And and again, to go back to the example of medicine, what I would say is that uh, I have a lot of friends who went to medical school and who, who are, you know, doctors, experienced doctors today. And the one thing that was very common is the amount of time and effort that they had to put into their work. It was almost like IIT students. I mean, they were constantly, you know, uh, working to, to develop their skills. Uh, and and one of the things I have heard from them is that very often in the process of qualifying to become a doctor, you lose the empathy that you need to have for the patient, you you almost think of a pa- patient as a as an object to be cured, you know, and 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 that sense of humanity is lost. But if you have AI based tools that are actually able to help you with the mechanical aspects of of, di- of how how to diagnose a condition, then maybe that frees up enough time, you know, and and gives you enough more hours in the day to really connect with the patient mm. at a human level. And I have seen some research that shows that it is that sense of human connection between the doctor and the patient and the sense of trust and confidence that is generated between the doctor and the patient that is actually even a more important part of healing than mm-hmm. just the mechanical administration of drugs. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and so I'm actually very optimistic about the future in the sense that even when, even though you may have all these technologies, uh, if you if you use them in a wise way, uh, in in a way that amplifies your humanity rather than uh, destroys it, uh, then I think we are headed for a better future. So, but some of the qualities that probably students can work on, or or teachers can focus in giving to imparting to students. So, I that would be you know qualities like empathy, uh, mm-hmm. compassion, uh, kindness, uh, you know, uh, creativity 
curiosity uh, the more and which is why I think there is a renewed uh, push for uh, education from being just stem based to uh, or, or you know science technology engineering and math to something that is more steam like which is which adds arts you know mm. uh, uh, into into the equation uh, mm. so adding uh, you know a core component of the humanities into technical education uh, i think would would make a lot of sense to me right so let's talk about your course and your book the lasting leadership mm. so um, so you're you're here at iit taking the course and it's a workshop it's a uh, it's a it's a short the email said a short course on lasting leadership <laughs> Right. So, yeah, a week-long course uh, on lasting leadership or a workshop. So, um, what, according to you, is the most important quality that a leader requires? We've talked about multiple qualities over the classes, <laughs> but one that probably stands out for you. Uh, <clears throat> it, it's a quality that, uh, you know, I have not yet spent much time talking about. But I, I, I think one of the most important qualities for leaders today is compassion. Uh, and and because there really is no substitute for it. I mean, you can talk about other qualities like leaders have to be you know, truth tellers, they have to learn fast, they, they have to be adaptable. You know, we've talked about behaviors like uh, being reliable or managing relationships, you know, those kinds of, I mean, these are all very important attributes. But if you have all these things, but you don't have compassion, uh, you may end up being not a, you may be a successful leader, but you may not be a particularly good leader. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, so one of the things that uh, we talked about in the beginning of the workshop was that becoming a leader is an act of choice. Uh, but an equally important aspect of leadership is you you have a you have a choice of what kind of leader you want to be, because there are many many different ways of leading, and and there are many many different styles of leadership that you can observe. Uh, but the leaders whom I have admired most <clears throat> combine all these other qualities with the very hum- human quality of being compassionate, right. and and focusing not on themselves but on the people they're trying to serve. So, so since you uh, appreciate the value of uh, knowledge so much, what, on a closing note, what advice would you like to give to people who are trying to seek knowledge or to share knowledge? So what do you have to say to them? Okay. The, um, I would say keep investing in your own knowledge and then share it as widely as you can with everyone who wants to learn. Because knowledge is the one thing that multiplies the more you give it away. You know, and, and you can't really hoard knowledge. I and mean, if you hoard knowledge, it deteriorates. But the more you keep investing in yourself and learning more and more and sharing it, uh, it's the right thing to do for yourself, but also the right thing to do for the world. Right. Thank you so much, Mukul, sir. It was, it was truly enlightening to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mukul. It's very enlightening for me too. Thank you. Thank you.